Hailed the toy of the century, in 2000, Lego found themselves facing new technologies, new competition. Their leaders were grappling with the question of do they double down on their core values and current projects and products or shift to bold innovation and change to plan for the future. In 2009, Paul Pullman became CEO of Unilever. What he found was the multinational in a tailspin. They needed a financial turnaround. Yet he also dreamed of making a positive social impact by reducing their environmental footprint. At the time, Unilever touched 2 billion consumers a day. For 25 years, I've studied tensions such as this. As a management researcher, I examine how organizational leaders make decisions in a world full of tensions. Think tug of war, intense competing demands pulling at opposite ends of our rope. It's not just organizational leaders. We all do this. We all live in tensions, right? Do, do we focus in on the demands of today, or do we plan and explore for opportunities for tomorrow? Do we take a job for the money or for its fit with our personal mission? We swim in a sea of tensions. We, they, work, life, self, others, stability change. The list is endless. The question isn't whether we face tensions. It's how we respond. And what I found in my research is that tensions are double-edged swords. On the one hand, they can paralyze and polarize us. But on the other, they can add great value. They can spark creativity, energy, and learning. The question, again, is how we respond. Now, for most, our default is to either or thinking, right? We weigh the pros and cons facing a dilemma and we make a decision. Or more accurately, we make a trade-off. This approach feels comfortable, clear, logical. It gives us a sense of control when we make that choice. It's also limiting and can be destructive. I mean, in this big, beautiful, complicated world, are we really limited to binary choices? But worse, my primary co-author and I, Wendy Smith, have found that either or thinking can spur some really vicious cycles. We've seen three patterns in particular. The first is intensification. As humans, facing a dilemma, we tend to keep leaning in our preferred direction. We dig a deeper and deeper rut until we find ourselves down a rabbit hole. This is what happened to Lego. Their laser-sharp focus on their disciplined values of quality control, cost control, led them to continuously enhance and leverage their brilliant system of bricks. It was very successful. You know, for almost 100 years, Lego was profitable year after year. But focusing solely on your demands of today is a trap. Because you've still got to look out, look around, boundary span. What happened with Lego is they realized they'd missed major changes. They were out of step, and they had actually started losing money. Now, the next piece, when we think about that, and we've all done that, right, that down the rabbit hole, you start focusing on today's to-do list, you're fighting today's fires. Believe me, it will build your current strengths. It will sharpen your habits and routines and your focus. But again, you too, I've done this, can find yourself complacent, stagnant, maybe burned out. That triggers the second vicious cycle. We call this overcorrection. We swing the pendulum. We realize at the bottom of that rabbit hole that we need the opposing side. The problem is we tend to swing too hard. And in swinging so hard, we actually destroy the good that we've done. When Lego realized that they had missed some major market changes, they went all in on bold innovation. Impressively, they started developing new products at record pace. Yet in doing so, they lost sight of their past, their core discipline, their most loyal customers. Within five years, they were on the brink of bankruptcy. We've all done this too, right? Overcorrected, I've done it. Found myself burned out, a little lost made a radical shift, new role, new organization, even new country, and in doing so, left behind 
experiences, priorities, and people that matter. The vicious cycle we call trench warfare. This pattern is when we defend our rut and battle against those in the opposing rut. We see this in organizations, between groups, in politics, even around our dinner table. Instead of listening and learning from the other's perspectives, as well as experiences, we shoot across our different ruts. And in fact, as doing that, we become increasingly insular and isolated within those ruts, and we dig deeper and deeper in opposite directions. That's polarization. Now, thankfully, one of the key things I've learned in studying paradoxes is that the problem is not the problem, the way we think about the problem. So how do we shift our approach? When I started studying great leaders who were really good at navigating these tensions, I sought insights from maybe unsuspecting places. I started to explore philosophy and religion, psychology, literature, and what I found is that paradox has inspired brilliant both and thinkers for centuries. Here's what I mean. For example, Harvard psychologist um, Albert Rothenberg studied creative geniuses. He read their letters, their journals, their works, and he found something they had in common. They all embraced tensions as sparks for creative friction. So Picasso, valued the interplay of light and dark, the expected and the bizarre. Mozart juxtaposed harmony and discord. Virginia Woolf grappled with life and death. And Albert Einstein explored the contradictions of the atomic world, finding objects, both particles and waves, in motion and at rest. What thinkers found was the value of a paradox mindset. Now, when we say the word paradox, it actually comes from ancient Greece. Paradoxa, it means beyond belief. Because it seems illogical, even absurd, that opposites could coexist. But from a paradox mindset, tensions are natural, human, and valued. So think the Taoist symbol of yin-yang. It's a beautiful illustration. The light flows into the dark, the dark flows into the light, the contradictions are interwoven into a greater whole. I mean, let's think about this. The decisions we make today will determine our tomorrow, just as our dreams for tomorrow guide our actions today. Wisely making and stewarding our money can fuel our mission. So the issue is, how do we make the most of paradox and empower both and thinking. You don't have to be a creative genius to do this, but you do need some key steps. The first step is change the question. The questions we ask, the way we frame them, determines the possibilities. So make a shift from or to and. And I don't just mean a simple word change. This shift is really about a, a change in our underlying assumptions. When Paul Pullman entered Unilever, he did not ask, should Unilever be financially responsible or socially responsible, right? He asked, how can we become highly profitable and sustainable? How could I turn around this firm financially through positive social envir and environmental impact? Likewise, in your careers, don't sell yourself short, asking, do I follow the money or my mission? Think a little bit bigger. How might I do good in this world and pay the bills? How might I find opportunities that empower me to make a positive impact and achieve financial success? Here is about changing the question. The second step we call separating and connecting. When it comes to separating, what I mean is really pulling apart these contradictions, diving into each side, asking yourself, what does each side bring to, to me at its best and its worst? And then connecting, bringing them together, looking for synergies that can hold them together and a higher purpose that could do the same, serve as the glue. So in the case of Unilever, as an example, 
So Paul Pullman realized that he had to pull together his dream of financial and social responsibility. He developed something called the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan. The goals were really clear. In 10 years, we're gonna double the profits and cut in half our environmental footprint. And by the way, when people first saw the plan, they said, that's absurd. That's not how it works. The bigger the company grows, the more harm it does. And he said, absolutely not. Not when we touch two billion consumers a day. So a real shift. But then what he did is he held himself and his employees accountable to continuously separate. So say they'd launch a new product. He'd ask with every one of these projects, okay, show me the financial benefits. How are you gonna lead in the market? How are you gonna reduce costs? How are you gonna grow your customers? And then show me the, the social benefits. Show me that we're gonna reduce waste, water, energy use, engage the local communities, and use the plan to hold them together. We can do this in our own lives. When we think about our jobs and our careers, maybe there are opportunities to pull them together, but let's think first about separating them. I can follow my mission. I can find a great opportunity to make a positive impact, but if I focus solely on serving and giving, I won't build the resources to actually fund and causes I care about. Likewise, if I follow the money, strictly follow the money, I'll have a good life, I'll make sure my talents are well valued, I'll probably will need to take care of others and causes, but in that singular focus, I'm very likely to cut corners, contradict my values, and cause harm. The point in separating that on the individual level is that you start to realize the cons the downsides of one are the upsides of the other and vice versa. It motivates you to find opportunities to find, make the best of both worlds, stay in the positives of both. The final step is reconsider your outcomes. Rather than trade-offs, I want you to think mules and tightrope walkers, all right? A mule is a creative integration. Stronger than a horse, smarter than a donkey, win-win. We can find mules, for example, say in our careers. Maybe we decide we're gonna start a social enterprise, actually fund ourselves through our mission, or find opportunities, create them even within our existing job that make a better impact on our community. Paul Pullman found a few mules while he was at Unilever. I'll give you an example. While they were launching surf detergent in Africa, they started experimenting with sachets. Sachets are like little packets of detergent. And what they found, they used less packaging, less water, they were easier to transport, which meant less pollution, their local communities could sell them better, all the social side, and they were super profitable because they reduced costs and customers really liked them. They really like them. So as we think about that though, one of the implications of mules is mules are sterile. And here's what I mean by that. A mule is a one-off. It's temporary, it's fleeting, and they're rare. More often, we see tightrope walkers. A tightrope walker is basically moving forward continuously, looking at a point in the horizon, a key goal. They are walking forward and making micro shifts left and right as they go. Very careful not to go too far to either side or they fall off. We can do that in our lives. Pullman did that by making sure that when times were tough, he could say, I'm gonna be consistently inconsistent. If we need to, we're gonna focus a little bit more on the finance our revenues and our costs, and then when resources are flush, we're gonna reinvest. We're gonna invest in our social innovations, our communities, and our people. But always using the sustainable living plan as guardrails, double the profit, cut in half the environmental footprint. And as he did that, he started to move forward. That's the point. In our own lives, we tightrope walk all the time, but maybe we're not doing it with intention. How do we decide to make opportunities? Say we have a chance to really grow our resources. We use that. We actually build our opportunities 
and then reinvest in our own mission and funds, but all the while keeping our values as our guardrails. It's absolutely vital. The benefits of both am thinking and this power of a paradox mindset can be great organizations who get really good at this. Lego, thankfully, figured it out. Today, they're one of the most innovative and disciplined firms in the world. Likewise, Paul Pullman, he hit both of those ambitious targets. He turned around Unilever, and he continues today to challenge multinational CEOs to be more sustainable, more inclusive, and more conscientious in their capitalism. In my most recent phase of research, I've really been focusing in on a paradox mindset at the individual level. So Wendy Smith and I joined up with Ella Marone Spector, Josh Keller, Amy Ingram. We've studied thousands of people across continents and across languages. The way we measure a paradox mindset is two dimensions. On the first, we say, how much do you experience tensions? And on the second, what's your response? Do you approach attention as a challenge or as an opportunity? What we found in all that research is that the more intense individuals experience tensions, the, the greater the positive impact of a paradox mindset. What I mean by that is, specifically, when you face intense ch challenges, or at least in our subjects, what the employers, their employers would tell us is those individuals with a paradox mindset are higher performers and more creative. And when we asked the individuals themselves, they told us they were also more satisfied, higher performing, greater creativity, more satisfied. Those are powerful impacts of a paradox mindset. Almost a quarter of a century studying tensions, I can tell you, you can develop your paradox mindset, empower your both and thinking. Tap into that positive potential by embracing tensions to spark creativity, learning, and change, and thrive, because shifting your mindset will open your opportunities. Thank you.